Hello and welcome to another episode of the Little Knowledge Podcast, where this time we're talking about Abba Pegum House in Glenith, which is a request. So it's our first real request that we've uh, we've done. Mm. My name is Paul Busby and with me as always is Gough Morgan. Hello, Gough. Hello. Hello there. Greetings, Stu. <gasps> yeah, a request. Gough? Isn't it nice? Nice to follow up on a request. We've had a, some interesting leads from people. So... Uh, over we we'll uh, you know we'll hope we follow through with them up won't we yeah we've had a few requests this is the first one i think we've managed to get around to we had a request mm. just this week for chepstow castle oh nice so but i'm always yeah. a bit wary about the really famous places because there's so much out there already but maybe yeah, but they don't you don't talk an awful lot about the people though that were there sometimes do we so i think mm. and it's later live you tend to talk about it in the set period so there's a lot to mm. say about uh, about the later history of Chepstow Castle, I should imagine, because you know it hasn't always, you know, the, it, it's it's glory period of the medieval and William Marshall and stuff is quite a long way away now. <laughs> so I'm sure there's a lot more. You know, what happened in the Victorian period there would be very fascinating to find out what was going on and who owned it, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll certainly uh, we'll have a think about that because there's Kevin yeah. Isla, which was another one I wanted to do, which was a request mm. uh, for a Monmouthshire video. But we'll get we're like a heritage jukebox, aren't we, Gone? <laughs> Just put your nickels in the slot and away we'll yeah. talk. <laughs> now, today is Abapegum House in Glenneath. Does that mean anything to you, Goff? Yeah, no, it's a totally new thing for me. I have not heard of it at all. To be honest, I didn't know that much about it before I started researching it, only that there were a lot of the papers that survived. When I was at the National Library of oh, Wales... Gosh. In a, in Aberystwyth, looking at the Morgan papers, which, yeah. oh, gosh, do you know what? That's nearly, that is 20 years ago now. Oh. When I was doing that, I, there were loads of Abapegum <laughs> papers. Yeah. I was very envious of the personal correspondence that survived from that archive, but I didn't really know much about the place, and it's a, it's a fascinating place. So what we'll do is we'll have a little look where we are, as yep. we always do. Here we go. Now, where we are here is... We are in uh, Glenith is up here, okay? There's Glenith, yep. the Vale of Neath. And down here, you have Abapegum House. Now, oh, yes, know, we are. We often do the slide in scale to show what it looks like by satellite image in today. We did that with the yep. Gare House very successfully, didn't we? Yeah. Um, and we get this from the National Museum of Scotland. This is, the, I think, the best site for these slide-in uh, maps yeah. before and after. We've already got little things that make you wonder. This is the 19th century. You've got Abapegum House, but you've got the old coal pit. Yeah, the old coal pit. Isn't that interesting? And you've got the drift. And yeah. uh, they were certainly onto something, because if you look at that site today... How's that for industry on your doorstep? Oh, good Lord. Yeah. Oh, yeah, crazy. Most, most people, when you say Abba Pegum, will think of the colliery. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, that's there. The colliery was um, uh, closed in 1985, but reopened in 1996. So it's still going. Oh, right. And it well, helps it's because it's, it's one of the best um, sort of sources for anthracite coal, the really hard coal in the world. Hmm. Oh, gosh. And they reckon that there's still probable reserves of 7.6 million tonnes of coal <laughs> on this site. So you can see how it turned into an industrial site. Yeah, quite. And uh, yes, the fact that the house itself doesn't look very prominent is probably not a good sign for what happened to it, Goff. <laughs> no, it's a, a, a bit of a giveaway. That's all they can say. <laughs> oh, dear. No, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it gets very to, distressing, doesn't it? <laughs> don't try to sort of G yourself up for a happy ending on this one. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> but we'll see what we do. But anyway, that this is where we are today. Yeah. Um, now, <sighs> it's quite an old site. Um, near there, by the way, uh, it goes all the way back to, well, let's say it goes all the way back. You can read some histories and they say Abba Pergum has 900 years of history. And then you look at it and you think, has it though really prominent history? Because there's yeah. not an awful lot before the 15th century. And in the 15th century, it was the home of Hris Ap Shansin, who was the prominent patron of the bards and poets. Oh, right. 
And poetry is the theme that runs really right through Abba Pergum. And oh, it was gosh, known at the time as Neav Pergum, Pergum Hall. That's how it was known, a bardic hall back in the 15th century. As for what Pergum means, I mean, Abba is sort of mouth of or yeah. head of. Pergum, some definitions, it means perfume. So Abba Pergum might be the sweet or fragrant valley, which is quite oh, nice. Oh, gosh. Oh, that, yeah. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, we'll go yeah, with the that. The fragrant valley. Bad. Yeah. yeah, perhaps. Yeah, perhaps it was a you know. When frequently these places are named when the first lot they, they go in and it's the season that they hit on. So like Golden Valley, it was golden because it was autumn and mm -hmm. things like this. So perhaps they went in in you know at the height of the flowering season and then it was very perfumed and scented around you before like it became a coal that. mine. <laughs> yeah, before the coal mine, slightly different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's rather upsetting, really. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they were there for a while, and then the Williams family, who we're going to concentrate on today, turned up in the 1500s, and they came from Blind Baglan, mm. and they moved in, and their crest was a lamb with, the, with a flag. And so that is why the nearby pub, which was actually on that map we just saw in Glyneath, yeah. and it is still there. So if we get this up, it's why it's called the Lamb and Flag. Lamb and Flag, yeah. We've noticed this. Local pubs remember, don't they? They remember the local history and mark it. It's, ve it's very interesting, the lamb and flag. There's lots of lamb and flag. Well, this is pubs. biblical. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. It's the biblical over biblical hangover, isn't it? Because the yeah. lamb is uh, is Christ. I'm not sure what the flag is, particularly. But... Hmm. A lot of them used to be pilgrimage start points hmm. or, or finish points. So that's, a, so that's an intriguing one as well. So perhaps there was a pilgrimage route around... Uh, at, at some point in the in the area as well. Oh, quite conceivably. I mean, the well, Williams you've got Saint, is... a Saint Caddock's Church there, and Saint Caddock is a mm. uh, new people Newport know of Saint Caddock because it's a uh, uh, the mental health hospital. Um, yeah. And uh, but yeah, it, it, Saint Caddock was a, quite a, a major figure. Um, mm. he, he's not he, um, he's a major saint. You know, he's not a he's not a tuppenny halfpenny come lately Johnny. He's a he's a he's a big one. He was a second to Saint David in the, the first Bishop of Wales. You know, he was the mm. runner up, shall we say. <laughs> yes. Well, there are so, these things do linger. I mean, the Williams family motto, which translated from the Welsh is he who suffers triumphs, was actually taken on by Glamorgan Council. That's the motto of Glamorgan Council to this day. Oh, gosh. So they did make their mark, uh, uh, really. Mm. But this family were uh, descendants of Morgan ap Caradoc ab Yestin, the lords of Neath Valley. A Yestin was one of the last princes of Glamorgan as well. So the Williamses do go right back. So perhaps it's a little harsh, actually, of Professor Robert Thomas Jenkins to say in a sentence about the Williamses, they had no particularly noteworthy members until the end of the 18th century. <laughs> little cheeky. <laughs> they were notable Descendants to of Welsh mothers. princes, really. <laughs> <laughs> they were notable to their mothers. Um, yeah, yes. the, <laughs> the first image we actually have of Abba Pergum is uh, 1790s. So here it is. Yeah. And these pillars oh. might be interesting later. Just uh, remember those pillars, Gov. Okay. Little pillars you can see there. Yeah. Um, and we do know before this period, the Civil War was relatively interesting because it was said that Cromwell um, spared Abba Pergum because he thought somewhere down the line he was related to the Williamses. Oh, really? So it wasn't oh, pillaged. That's yeah, oh, that's interesting. And we also know he halted at Abba Pergum on his way to Milford Haven when he was on his way to Ireland. So uh, it's hard to find out exactly how and why and how much is legend, but Cromwell, it appears, thought he had a connection with the Williamses of Abba Pergum. Uh, one thing they did do was they were always pretty faithful to the Welsh language, the Williamses. Mm. And they turned Abba Pergum into a sort of a centre of Welsh culture, in a way, alongside the uh, Flanova model. Yeah. Um, so they always had, uh, they had a bard called David Nicholas. And it was said that he might have been the last family bard in Wales, David Nicholas. Oh, uh, right. A bit more research at the end of the 18th century suggests he was at Abba Pergum, where he died, as a tutor rather than as an official family bard. Yeah. Um, but he was there, and uh, it was said he knew Latin, Greek, French. And when he died, they actually put a plaque. You mentioned St. Caddock's Church, and yeah. it's still there, a plaque to him. 
David Nicholas. David Nicholas, yeah. Unfortunately, for some reason, they get his uh, birth and death date completely wrong. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Not a good start. <laughs> Not really. It was. We think it was 1705 to 1774, rather oh, than right. 1693 to 1769. Yeah. But hey, it, it's a it's a nice thought, isn't it? It's in the ballpark, you know. It's not, it's not completely. Yeah. Well, we say he was a tutor. Was he actually writing praise poetry for the family then? Uh, no, I don't think that any praise poetry specifically praising the Williamses survives from David Nicholas. Right. So well, he, he was... as, a, as a family bard, you would be, you know, commissioned. It could be that Yolo Morganug may well have been the last family bard because of what yeah. he did for the Dunravens. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? Magic, they say it, I know that it lingered on a long time, this, this bardic uh, post within Wales. It, it died it... out a lot, lot earlier in England. Oh, absolutely. Uh, there, used, there was a talk of a book of Abapegum or the Abapegum Chronicle which was supposedly the lost works of Caradoc, who was a 12th century cleric and a contemporary of Geoffrey of Monmouth, his lost works. And it was rumoured that it was at Abapegum. And the good no. news goth was, in the late 18th century, someone made a copy of the book of Abapegum. The bad news is it was Yolo Morganug. Ah, yes. Mm, yes. <laughs> Don't keep, keep your fingers crossed on that one, then. <laughs> and academia has made the decision, considering the inaccuracies, and um, that it was another YOLO forgery, unfortunately. Well, it, it's a difficult one with YOLO saying it's absolute forgery, because he frequently did get the sources, but what he tended to do was cobble them together. He wasn't as authentic to the sources, as you say. He wasn't ever entirely fraudulent. But uh, sometimes he would create the linking passages. He would just invent to, to he'd snatch a bit from here and a bit from there, and then sort of construct a whole out of them. The whole mm. never itself exists, but pieces of it might have. So. Pieces of it might have, but it's generally assumed by academics that this was another one of Yolo's romantic ventures, shall we say? See, the problem yeah, that, with Yolo that... is that he and because a lot of what he does doesn't actually make sense to the time period it was supposed to be written so mm. like you say he's filling in the blanks yeah a lot of it doesn't make sense it's in the wrong style it's mm. it's clunky it's it's clearly got a fair bit of yolo in it is that the most mm. polite way of putting it yeah oh, yeah it's better yeah. uh, the thing is with yolo is he was a uh, romantic <coughs> a romantic is a great person to regenerate the culture of a nation brilliant but not always mm. the best historian well, I'm quite fond of him, but this is another one of his that makes you scratch your head and think, oh, that's a pity. <laughs> oh, to get my hands on the actual sources he was fiddling with. <laughs> yeah, which, of course, hasn't ex doesn't exist anymore, hasn't been found, which again adds to the problems, doesn't it, really? Hmm. But anyway, there you go. That's, that's what happens. Um, this, not a great paint in this, I think you'll agree, but this is Reese Williams. Uh, he was the one who gave Daffod Nicholas his job. Oh, and they gave him a home. And Reese was the one that decided to take the coal mines, and they were already making money from coal as early as 1670 at Abba Pergum. Blimey, that's early. But he took the coal mines into his own hands. So mm. this is very different. This isn't aristocrats leasing it to other people to run far mm. away from the ancestral home. This is mm. on his doorstep, and he's taking control. So unusual. Yeah. Hmm. Quite unusual. And he was very big, of course, into Welsh culture as well. But his daughter became quite an, uh, it's an overused word, but in this sense, definitely is true, a uh, rather iconic figure in Welsh culture. And here she is. This is Maria Jane Williams. Uh, she became known as Clinos or the Linnet because of her beautiful singing voice. She sang Welsh songs. Growing up at Abapegum, Welsh was the uh, language you learnt first as a child, and mm. all the servants spoke Welsh as well. She played the harp. She was a guitar player. And uh, she was imbued with this Welsh culture, you know. And mm. you can imagine mm. long summer evenings with harpists on the lawn at Abapegum yeah. and bards or, or nouveau bards declaiming yes. <laughs> poetry. Yeah. Um, she was, like I said, a great guitar player. Um, she also did, with her sister Elizabeth, she did the society bits. So she went to Cheltenham, she went to Llanover, 
which you talked oh. about, Goff, in our yeah. Han Arf Court video, and uh, and Dunraven Castle. Which oh, dovetails right. Dovetails nicely from our last yeah. one. Now, oh, I'll just right, tell you so the she... facts on this, Goff, and I'll see what you think. Right. In 1826, Maria Jane Williams um, stayed at Adair Manor in County Limerick, the home oh. of the Earls of Dunraven, of course, the Irish Oh, home. yeah. And she was there for a few months. And when she came back, she came back with a baby. Oh, found one, yeah. Found one. Publicly, the baby, Fanny Baker, was the, quote, niece of her servant, Jemima Baker. However, uh -huh. in reality, it was her, her, her own illegitimate uh, child. Yes. Um, that was a bit of a giveaway from the start, wasn't it, really? I'm <laughs> <laughs> well, going away and coming back with a baby rather than a postcard, yeah. 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 <laughs> What have you brought back from Ireland, dear? Oh, good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you've also lost weight. What's going on here? <laughs> you've, you've lost weight and the nurse doesn't look, the maid doesn't look at all tired. <laughs> <laughs> now, who the father was, uh, it's either uh, her father's gardener, John Randall, or as some people think because of where she stayed, it may well have been this man, Henry, second Earl of Dunraven himself. Ah, yes, he did. We came across him. I mean, he he tended to put it about rather, best way to describe it. Yes, yes, and he uh, he kept it was said a shooting box on the estate specifically for his amorous adventures. <laughs> and uh, yes, and she does go to Dunraven's one of the Dunraven properties and comes back with the child. And then when she leaves Abba Pergum, when her brother gets married and inherits, she goes to Unislas Cottage. Which was owned by the Earl of Dunraven. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And leased to her, so um, it's possibly yeah. it's probably more him than the gardener. I think it's safe to say. Yeah, more likely, isn't it? She got involved. She had an interest also in folk tales, the folklore of the Glynneath and Wales mm. region, and she was friendly with a chap called Crofton Croker, who produced a book called Irish Fairy Legends, and the supplementary bit involved something written by Maria Jane Williams herself. And oh, if you gosh. don't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll read a little bit to you, if that's okay. Yeah. Let's set the scene. Isn't that pretty? Oh, it's lovely. Now, this is the fairy tale. And I'll be interested what you think after this, Goff. Let us imagine a summer's day, one of those summers of the past when Miss Williams rambled to and fro without let or hindrance. No colliery had then been opened at the back of Abba Pergum, no brickwork or other industries could be seen, and the way of entrance in and departure from the valley was by wagon or coach at rare intervals. The Vale of Neath was a great track of deep woods and sylvan recesses, of a babbling river, and of a leafage which tried the painter's art. Very mm. nice. Mm. And the tale is about a guy called Schenkin, who was a woodsman in, in the area, who sits down near the river for his dinner of bread and cheese, and he waited and had a drink at the riverside. So Schenkin sat himself down and ate with relish. It was a warm day, satisfied with himself and having none of the troubles which pester the world now. He yielded to the warmth, to the drowsy air, to the strange lullaby song around, and lying at full length on one of the large trees he had levelled, slept. He slept and the river babbled on. Schenkin awoke gently as children wake and looked around and he rubbed his eyes. Why, the sun was high in the heavens when he went to sleep, and now it was low down. Where was his coat? Gone. Axe. Surely someone was playing the fool with him. That rusty iron was not his bright axe. And the handle, this rotten wood, that was never his. Schenkin shook himself to see if he was dreaming and took his homeward way. He felt quite stiff. His bones ached. Ah, there was his home at last. In the mellow light of evening, he saw a man working in his garden. Who could that be? and a strange woman with a child in her arms looked out at the approaching woodman and said something. Then there was a sadness in the tone, as that used towards a homeless man. Shankin, Shankin seemed to feel all at once that this, his home, was no longer his. That man in the garden was just such a man as he was 25 years ago. Was there a spell around him? He nudged up to the man, whose face was now distinctly visible. It was his own, and yet oh. not his own. 
but uh -huh. this is the cottage of Schenkin the Woodman, he exclaimed at length. It was his, was the reply, over twenty years ago, but he went away and was never seen again. I am his son. And your mother, cried Schenkin, dead this ten year. Then Schenkin knew that he had been in the fairy's power and that his <laughs> sleep of a few hours was that of a quarter of a century. <laughs> it was said that Schenkin was buried soon after in the same grave as his wife, but he stayed there looking out as, as long as possible into the heavens at a different era entirely. That was one of Maria's fairy tales. Well, it's, about that. it's a nice little story, isn't it? It's very traditional. Oh, very much yeah, so. The, the time slip element in, in fairy tales is uh, very interesting. Um, it's like, uh, it's almost like a Rip Van Winkle sort of thing in a way, but he oh, appears yeah, to have very, disappeared. They're very common. Yeah, you go under the hill and you come out and you've been there for hundreds of years and it, uh, what have you. It, the the, the time, time fiddling properties are one of the features of, of the fairy, fairy world. It's really interesting. Hmm. Oh, that's quite nicely done, isn't it? It's not bad. But uh, more importantly... How she managed to write that echo, I don't know. Well, she was a clever woman, I told you. She was Linos, <laughs> she was the linnet. She sang songs, played the harp, she was brilliant. <laughs> so brilliant, she was welcomed into Lady Llanover's circle. Uh, so 1836 I Stethford, that sort of thing, the Abergavenny mm -hmm. I Stethford. And uh, she, uh, she wanted, she won a prize in 1837 for the best unpublished original Welsh air. And the prize was given by an old friend of ours, Goff, Lady Elizabeth Coffin Greenley. Oh, hooray! <laughs> I'm a fan of her. <laughs> and she was uh, really was part of it. In fact, she wrote a, a book which was published in 1844 and is still in print to this day in various versions. Uh, Maria Jane wrote the ancient national airs of Gwent and Morganug. Oh. And they got permission, thanks to Lady Flanova, to dedicate it to Queen Victoria herself. So. Oh, gosh, that's interesting. So I mentioned the harpists at these yeah. uh, cultural gatherings at the Eisteddfods, the harp, the Welsh harp was of extreme importance, a lot of importance, mm. so much so that Sir Charles Morgan of Tredegar each year gave a harp as a prize. And that was called the Tredegar harp. And his son, Charles Morgan, Robinson Morgan, created uh, and gave the Rupera harp for the Eisteddfods for many, oh, many my. years. Uh, this harpist here, is the it's what it blind harpists seem to happen quite a lot in Wales at this time. Now this is uh, this is Matthews the blind harpist who played at Abba Pergum. Oh gosh. We know that Thomas Lewis was also a blind harpist who played at Abba Pergum, and this was also the era of the famous Parry the blind harpist mm. in Southeast Wales as well. It's interesting. Yeah. Very interesting how that works out. Um, the servants at the time, as I said, were imbued with the spirit of uh, Welsh culture. They had portraits, some of them, such as Old John of Abba Pergum, you can see here. <laughs> Early 19th century, Old John. Yeah. Some of the servants had to wear the Abba Pergum um, uh, plaid. And here's an example of the Abba Pergum plaid. Plaid? Yes. Plaid. Well, oh, sorry, plaid, yeah. It's like... <laughs> Yes, uh, plaid, yes. The Abba Pergum plaid, you can see there. And if you oh. want a picture of, uh, of Maria Jane Williams herself in later years, it looks as if she's just about to go on tour. Here she is. Oh, hey! <laughs> yes. Very rock and roll. <laughs> yes, she's ready to go, isn't she? <laughs> um, where she lived at Unislas Cottage, um, she had a little <coughs> bench there, which survived well into the 20th century, where she would sit. And sadly, the cottage was destroyed in the 1950s. Oh. It was still in a fair condition, but yeah. it was pulled down in the 1950s. Anyway, she died at the age of 78. And with her book oh. still in print, I think she made her mark rather, didn't she? Yeah, but that's quite remarkable, isn't it? The Williamses chugged on. And here we are in front of uh, the pillars. Uh, and they continue this very pro-Welsh culture. William Williams, who was here in the early 19th century till he died in 1855. Oh, maybe he wasn't there much, though, because he travelled for 17 years. <laughs> like me. <laughs> that was a bit like Lady Coffin Greenlee's husband. Do you remember? Oh, yeah, yes. I'm just nipping out, dear. Never came back. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, William Williams was a classical scholar and apparently he had certain mastery of a Gallic, Spanish, Portuguese, Polish, Turkish, Arabic, and Persian. Oh, bloody. He went to North Africa. Uh, and uh, also he tagged along with the Duke of Wellington's Peninsula War. Again, it's one of these tourists that just tag along with an invitation to an army. Yeah, I, that's uh, the most boggling aspect of, of the, the British at war at that period, isn't it? People popping along and eating picnics and viewing the battle. Oh, yeah, really. <laughs> well, William Williams, with his uh, with his servant from Abba Pergum, merrily entered Toulouse with the victorious army of the Duke of Wellington. I'm not sure what part William Williams actually played in the campaign. No, I've got, yeah. <laughs> he was quite a likable man. He had he collected jars of water from the River Jordan to baptise his future children of the Abba Pergum family. I think the royal family do similar things. Yeah. Uh, but when he came home, he withdrew from society. And he stayed at Abba Pergum and he remodelled the gardens. He was very good with animals. He loved animals. He wouldn't allow any of his children to be cruel to animals. And these wonderful little signs were around the parkland of Abba Pergum. There was a little bench and on it, it said, a rest in place for Welshmen true. Let him thank God enjoy the view and then his onward way pursue. And when a little horse died, it was buried there, and a little plaque said, poor Corin lies in this sequestered spot. May his repose be as easy as his trot. <laughs> That's very cute. <laughs> yeah. Um, he did smoke a lot, and that was the undoing of William Williams. Um, right. He smoked an awful lot. And actually, there are letters at the time of people saying to him, even back then, I think you're smoking a little too much. And when they're saying that to you in the middle of the 19th century, yeah, you probably are smoking like a chimney, aren't you? Yeah, you're right, yeah. So he died in 1855. And I know you've got great uh, facial hair, Goff. I, I don't want to do you down on this. Everybody knows it who's seen these videos. <laughs> but William Williams' third son uh, took over, Morgan Stuart Williams, and it's quite impressive. It's not bad, is it? Oh, no. That's splendid. That's hmm. a splendid set of mustachios there, isn't it? <laughs> yes, he's working well. I like the little pointy beard as well. Yes, yes. Yeah, he's got he's got it all going on there. That's a deal of fiddling for the valet first thing in the morning, that isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not a mustache you'd maintain yourself. <laughs> no, you need a bit of help with that, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> now Morgan Stuart Williams was a third son because this was a time of, uh, of consumption. Oh. So his two elder brothers, I'm afraid, died very young. So Morgan took over. Uh, and it's interesting, actually, how he's described in landowners of the time. Usually they're described as a squire or master or gentleman of, of means or landed proprietor. He is described as colliery owner. Oh, gosh. And for someone of the gentry, that is quite unusual. Yeah, quite. But it does yeah. show how important uh, Coalface was at this yeah. point to the Williams family fortune, doesn't it? Mm. Oh, yeah, quite. And not even pretending it isn't. No, and, it's, uh, it's become a sort of badge of office, really, isn't it? It's a, a badge of honour, rather. They're, they're not uh, trying to hide trade. <laughs> no. They're very proud of what they're doing. No, and in fact, Morgan Stuart Williams was a pioneer of the anthracite coal trade in the Neath Valley. So he did make something of a success of it, but he was also, I mean, this fortune is building up and up now for the Williamses. Now you're mm -hmm. deep into the Industrial Revolution. So he takes a look at Abba Pergum House and he thinks, well, we need to rebuild it. So this is what it looks, I think, in 1874, before the rebuild. And it's quite interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's sort of castellated up here, isn't it? And you've got the yeah. gables here. And he makes, and he turns it into quite a vast property. There you go. Oh, yeah, gosh. It's a difference in style, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, quite. And I've got another little view of it here. Oh, gosh, yeah. It's imposing. Yeah, you can see. It's an imposing property, isn't it? I'm not sure what the cavalry are doing here. They're lined up. I'm not whether they're doing... Oh, yeah. They're... Yeah. Not sure. But what he's got, this became the new front where I'm waggling the cursor. Yeah. And at the top, he added an enormous Elizabethan style gallery. Now, at this point, he's basically rebuilt the whole thing. So this is really a 19th yeah. century house. They say the only old bit was possibly the kitchen. Right. The old Abba Pergum 
house of his ancestors, yeah. okay? We have a little look <coughs> inside, because I love this gallery. So it takes up practically all of this. And it's yeah. harking back to the old idea of the bardic halls of Glamorgan, you see. Oh, yes. Yeah, we've, we've seen... Um, where, there's another property we saw that had this same thing, didn't we? Ah, yeah. where was it now? Uh, there was a gallery at Kevin Mabley. Kevin Mabley had the similar thing, right? The gallery right across the top of the floor, wasn't it? And do you know what, Goff? It's interesting you make that point because Thomas Lewis, the bard of Abba Pegum, was also mm. the house bard of Kevin Mabley. Oh, gosh, you're interesting. So there might be some kind of connection yeah. that I haven't made here. Yeah. Oh, that's it. Yeah, it's intriguing. But look at the side. This is 94 it's feet long, this room. It's colossal, isn't it? And I think that That's might the entire be. upper floor of a building, isn't it? Really, if you think about it, entire, gosh, it literally is the entire yeah. floor of the building. We think this might well be Morgan Stewart Williams. It's hard to tell, yeah. Goff, because he's hiding his facial hair. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> I like the way they just tucked up right against the wall by the fireplace. <laughs> Come out a bit. <laughs> it's one of those places that in Regency, and I know it's not Regency, I know it's later Victorian, as, as we've said, yeah. a creation, but it's the sort of place that in Jane Austen novels, they would go for a turn around the room and really mean it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, you could promenade up and down there very nicely, couldn't you? It's not cosy, <laughs> though. No, no, quite. Yeah. Here's another room. You can see he's going for that old style feel, isn't he? Oh, yeah. Right oh, down yeah, to the pewter, of, it would appear on the mantel. Oh, Tudor panelling and all that. Jacobean type heading above the thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Above the um, fireplace, do If the name Morgan Stewart Williams rings any sort of bell with our, our viewers and our listeners, that's because he was the man who in 1899 also bought this place. Oh, right. Ah, ha, ha. St. Donuts. <laughs> St. Donuts, yeah. And he was the one who started to restore it. And he put the first great museum of armory there. He collected armaments from all around the world. It wasn't just Randolph Hearst. Yeah. Morgan Stuart Williams was the first one to put a, a very large, impressive museum of armory in St. Oh. Donuts Castle. Maybe bits of it may well have been in Abba Pergum before he moved it there. It's interesting. So he is something of a builder. So did um did Hearst end up buying the collection as part of the house as well then? Well, I, I don't think so. And the reason why I don't think so was oh. Morgan Stuart Williams, um, the, the Williams family sold it to an American businessman about two or three years before Hearst bought it. Oh, right. I presume they would have cleared yeah. it out. Yeah. But yeah. maybe parts of the Williams collection ended up there anyway, because you know what Hearst was like, well, yeah. looking around the world for pieces. Oh, he's a magpie by anything. Wasn't he? Yeah. Well, Morgan Stuart Williams married this lady. Now, this is Josephine Herbert, who is the sister of Reggie Herbert of Clither, one of my favourite characters. Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm fun there. You like Reggie. <laughs> and in Very the Abba badly Pergum, behaved, man. <laughs> very badly behaved. And in the Abba Pergum uh, letters, there's a letter uh, from the Herberts to Josephine at Abba Pergum. And just and saying, basically, look, keep an eye on Reggie. He's a marked man now. He's out on bail in Middlesex. Just try to keep him out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it's very much Reggie Herbert, yeah, that, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> now, just when things seem to be going brilliantly, Morgan Stuart Williams, in his early 60s, died very suddenly at St. Donat's Castle in 1909. Mm -hmm. And so far, the Williamses have been pretty impressively continuing the line, haven't they? We haven't mm. really had a spendthrift yet. No, no. He was to come. <laughs> Morgan Stuart Williams's son took over Godfrey Williams. Uh, and I've got a little image of Godfrey. There he is with his wife, oh. Miriam, who was a daughter of Lord Rendlesham. Now, Godfrey yeah. loved spending money. One of the first things he did was sell St. Donat's Castle, allegedly because of the ghosts. Oh, really? <laughs> but, Interesting. <laughs> at one point, there was a huge business deal, the newspaper said, that Godfrey Williams was going to sell Abba Pergum, sell all the coal mines, sell St. Donat's Castle, and come away with about, I think they said it was something like uh, six million pounds. That was the plan, uh, mm -hmm. allegedly. I mean, it didn't happen. Uh, but Godfrey Williams didn't spend much time at Abba Pergum. 
Uh, he liked traveling. I mean, you yeah. can see here with his wife, Miriam, and um, they headed off. Also, a little touch of scandal as well. Um, uh, he and Miriam divorced in 1923. It might not have helped that Godfrey ran off with the estate manager's daughter. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. The yeah, me. Um, Never mind. What he did yeah. like buying, however, was a series of enormous yachts. Oh, yeah. It's mentions there. He's on his steam yacht of the surprise. Yeah. I think the, the surprise is they seem to have just basically drawn his hat in with a pencil. I think I'm a, <laughs> yeah, a, they do. A surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> well, the surprise was quite oh, a yeah. vessel. The surprise. Oh, gosh, yeah. The surprise when he bought it was the sixth most expensive yacht in the world. Um, he bought it. It was originally the Royal Yacht of Belgium. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> so Godfrey yeah. bought it. I mean, it was extraordinarily... Uh, in fact, one of his yachts we don't have a very good picture of, only in sadder later days. It was called Idraig Goch. So it was the Red Dragon. Yeah. Idraig Goch. And uh, when oh. it was produced yeah. uh, in the early 20th century, it had electric lighting when most houses didn't have electric lighting. Gosh. And it was the first vessel that could completely circumnavigate the globe using only the coal it was carrying leaving port. Of course, that coal came from Godfrey Williams' own Abba Pergum estate. Gosh, yeah. Now, the Blimey. sad thing is, you see it here in many years later. In 1919, it became what was, it was turned into what is called an oil hulk. Basically stripped of everything, and it would refuel vessels, which yeah. it did in World War II. So no oh, longer particularly glamorous. No. One of his yachts, believe it or not, um, the Shannon Do, or Shannon Do, has survived. <laughs> oh God, that's unusual. There's an awful lot of them are broken up in the fifties. Nearly they? all of them. I mean, yeah. this one, for instance, was broken up at Cashmore's Yard in Newport in 1956. Oh, that's that's interesting. His cash walls broke up uh, Lord Tredegar's yacht as well, didn't they? Indeed, yeah. Yeah, the Liberty. Yeah. And here is one of it's a smaller yacht, yeah. but here it is, the Shannon Do, uh, or the Shannon Doe, I should say, and it's still here. He owned it in nineteen in the early nineteen twenties, yeah. and uh, it's looking pretty good. It's in Sark these days. Oh right, I was going to say where it was. Oh, interesting. So it's still there. And yeah. Have a, that's what it looks like inside. Oh, gosh. Well, that's, uh, oh, I say that's pretty sumptuous, isn't it? It's all very swanky, isn't it? Yeah. Although someone did say that, that although Godfrey Williams had all of these, you know, vessels and all of these houses, he lived in Cannes. Mm. He had a Mayfair pad. He had Abba Pergum house. He was the one who sold St. Donuts, by the way, as yeah. I said. Uh, but he seemed to spend most of his life uh, in hotels, in the very best suites. Gosh, that's so, I mean. To say that he moved his way through his inheritance money. Yeah. He had four daughters, married twice. He had no sons, so a nephew was in, gonna inherit. He mm. didn't leave that much ready cash for his nephew. Oh gosh. Oh no. <laughs> he certainly enjoyed himself, it's yeah. safe to say. And he gave right. strange gifts. Um remember I mentioned that pillar earlier on? Oh yeah. It's a better view of it here. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know why, but he gave a, a pillar as a gift to Glamorgan Council. Just the one? Just the one. Um, <laughs> he gave it to them, and it yeah. was moved, and you can still see it in King Edward VII Avenue to this day, looking out onto New Road. It's part of the Cardiff University complex, a place called Glamorgan Buildings, and it looks a little odd in its way because here it is today. Blimey! Hmm. You wouldn't speak. Isn't that what I mean? You wouldn't. You wouldn't spot it, would you? But in a way, it's, it's a lovely little piece. But you, you, you think well, you wouldn't question how it got there, sort of thing. Good lord! No, but uh, giving a pillar as a gift. I mean, I hmm, just one. I, don't, I don't. I don't think you're giving the pillar. You're giving the emblem on the front, aren't you? Ah, uh, yes, of course, because they've doing. used you're... the motto as well. Yeah, that's right. They, they're using the motto, so he's passed the brand on, if you like, for <laughs> a better phrase. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. That makes sense now. Well, you solved that little mystery, which was puzzling me. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you know, it's okay. It's not so bad. Um, 
as far as gifts go, I suppose. But as for the house, he had someone in it. <coughs> it was leased out at various times. He didn't really live at Abba Pergum at all, but with a caretaker there. You know, the grounds were still tended. Mm. Um, in World War II, Abba Pergum became the home, temporary home, of the East Anglian School for the Deaf. So throughout the oh. war, they moved from, I think it was Cromer in Norfolk, and they moved to uh, Abba Pergum. Uh, in 1948, uh, with the nationalization of coal, the National Coal Board took over Abba Pergum House. Um, Godfrey himself died in Jersey in 1956 at the age of 81. And you get the idea uh, that Godfrey really enjoyed those years. Yeah, yes, God, yeah. <laughs> So the nephew never really got much at all, then, because the house had gone to the coal board. <laughs> well, he still owned the house, but it was onto the coal board as a lease. But you're right, he didn't seem oh. to have an awful lot of ready cash, because mm. Godfrey got through it, and that's before mm. death duties, presumably. Oh, quite, yeah. So they've got land. They still owned, they still owned the house. Indeed, I'm pretty sure they still own the house to this day. Oh, What's right. What's left of it. I mean, the Williams family still carries on, the Williams of Abba Pergum, but mm. without Godfrey, they probably would have had more money, if that's not being too unkind. Yeah. <laughs> but we've got some lovely well, little pictures uh, of the inside of the house in the 1960s. So the coal board has been there, and we have a yeah. little look. It still doesn't look terrible. Oh, yeah. This is clearly so the, that long, gallery. the long gallery is still going up. The ceiling's still up. It's one of the first things to go, generally. Mm. Yeah. Not so oh, bad. No. no, quite, no. Panelling still nicely on the walls. Hmm. Not so oh, bad yeah. at all. A little bit of plaster coming off there, but that's about it. No, we've seen far worse, haven't we? We have absolutely seen far worse. But again, what do you do with it was a great debate uh, in uh, Glyneath for many, many years. I mean, whether the council, in fact, it was offered to the council for a peppercorn rent by the Williams family. Really mm. a peppercorn rent, absolutely tiny. Because mm. the problem with these buildings is it's the cost of the upkeep, isn't it? As well as oh, the yeah. restoration. Yeah. And as long as you had the caretaker there, and as long as it was being used by the National Coal Board, for all mm. the battering it got as a sort of an institutionalized building, it was mm. still there and being cared for. And then they left. Oh, here we go. And the caretakers seem to leave. There's a lovely yeah. video uh, in the 1960s. I'll put the link down below in the description where someone mm. in the 60s has taken a, a video camera and gone around the estate. So you'll see what it's like there while mm. the caretaker was still there. Um, but things started, I'm afraid, to... Uh, Declines somewhat, unfortunately. Is this still sharing, God? It is. Hmm. Okay. Uh, there is the uh, ah. there is the uh, house, uh, the door to Abba Pergum. Within yep. a very short period, very short period, it looked like this. Oh dear! Oh, 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 oh. oh in shame, that time. Oh, oh dear. Yeah. <laughs> it is a shame. Um, um, we've also got a little... Uh, this is typical of the headlines that the place was generating in the 1970s. The glory that was yesterday. Oh. Now too late to save Abba Pergum Mansion. Um, mm. The Williamses themselves, Idris Williams, uh, said... That, actually, what did it? Because it was left, there was an awful lot of vandalism rather mm. than fire. It was vandalized. All the windows yeah. were smashed, even the upper windows. Graffiti everywhere. Idris says they got a good arm. They even hit all the upper windows. Mm. And there you've got punk rules. Is oh. <laughs> all over That's it. Good. And it's really being battered. Uh, it's quite sad, really, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. It, 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 I always say an awful lot of these properties went because of the nature of them. They are so such a burden to maintain. You know, you and uh, at the point, you know, that point really. If you think about the early seventies, times were times are quite hard in the early seventies. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't blame any of the local authority for not trying to take something like this on. Mm. I mean, it was quite remarkable that Newport City Council decided to take Sadiga House on in early since nineteen seventy four. So this is obviously around that period, and lots of the lots of properties must be going through that same sort of point. Same Sad sort thing of is, this could have this could have been Sadiga House. 
Oh, it could easily. If think if about it, this could have been the, the bigger uh, house yeah. if it hadn't been, you know, if it if it hadn't uh, gone to the local authority at the time. Yeah, and of course the the benefit Tradiga House had was that it was run as a school for a while, so it wasn't. Yeah. It didn't have that spell of being left empty and 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 vulnerable to the vandals, did it? No. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, not not so great. And in fact, you won't be surprised to know that things didn't really get any better. I said it was vandalism rather than a fire, and in mm. 1983, the fire happened. Oh, gosh, so if it didn't have enough problems, there was a devastating fire as well. This is where the gallery used to be. Yeah. Oh, gosh, it's completely gone. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, the whole upper floor's gone. Oh, dear. What a shame. It does look rather a burnt-out husk. And yeah. there's the door now. I mean, it's, it's even yeah. worse than when I showed you earlier on. Yeah. So very, very sad. And uh, there, there were people working there, the last I heard. But what's left to save? I'm not entirely sure. I mean, more of the house does wrap around the hill here. Hmm. But it doesn't look great, does it really? No. no, no, it is a shame. But I don't want to end on such a sad note. Hmm. Um, and there is a positive, uh, quite a strange positive, actually. Um, in the early 1950s, a chap called Jack Thomas, who was headmaster at uh, Alderman Davis School in Neath, was driving in the area and he saw um, smoke billowing near some trees. So he carried on his way and he drove down the driveway and there he found Abba Pegum house. And on the grounds in front, he's called the owner, but it might have been the person who was leasing the property or it might mm. have been a caretaker, um, was burning stacks and stacks of documents from Abba Pegum house. Oh, gosh. Stacks of them. Um, and he ran up there and he loved history himself, Jack Thomas. Uh, and he said, look, look, can I, can I have some of these? These are historically important documents. And the man said, oh, help yourself. So mm. Jack loaded up the car, and the stuff he loaded up the car with were receipts, personal mm. correspondence, rentals, diaries, books of musings and jottings from the Williams family, an 18th century family prayer book, a fascinating Gosh. tiny Catholic order of service from 1636, which he saved, and watercolours. Oh, Lord, what? How did all? How did all this stuff survive to nearly go on the bonfire? The house has burned out. Oh no, no. How, it, how it were these documents after that? This is the fifties. Oh, the, uh, the house oh, sorry, burned ah. out in nineteen eighty-three. Right. It was papers that seemed to have been left by the Williams family, and um, whoever it was merrily thought it was a good idea to burn it all. Ooh. So it seems as if a lot of the Williams archives were still at Abba Pergum at the time. Yeah. So Jack Thomas, I have to say. Yeah, good hey, Lord. Well done, that man. So much Gosh. local history. Uh, uh, it is incredible uh, that what he managed to save. And yeah. he saved, this was going to go on the bonfire, a marvellous watercolour of the inside of Abba Pergum house, the drawing room. What? <sighs> That was gobsmacked that somebody's getting merrily chucking these on a bonfire. It would never occur to me to go, oh, that's a load of rubbish. What? Oh, I know. It's your brain melt, doesn't it? I know. And, and all historically important. There was even a little painting of a uh, remodeling of Abba Pergum House, which never happened. In 1836, oh. William Williams obviously toyed with the idea of rebuilding it before Morgan Stuart Williams did and turning it into a Tudor-style mansion. And unbelievably, the picture, uh, the architect's sort of painting, has survived oh. of the Abba Pergum that never was. Oh, that's it. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and again, it was going on a bonfire. Yeah. Oh, God. You might notice yeah. the fashion here, Goff, because this is very similar to what Octavius Morgan turned the friars in Newport into, isn't it? Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. Same yeah, period. Very, very similar. Yeah. Kind of like a oh, Yeah, that frontage of... particularly is very, that's very like it. Yeah. I mean, in incredible. Oh. So well done to Jack Thomas, the headmaster. And by oh, the way, yeah. this was only disp uh, our daughter, I think, of his gave all of this batch in 2016, uh, 2016 to the West Glamorgan archives who are still working their way through it all. Good Lord. Well, 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 well. So oh, who knows well, that's, what else? That's a, that's, a, that's a really good thing, isn't it? That's a, that's a good, upbeat thing. Yeah, the house to me is gone, but its story hasn't. 
And that's uh, something we've often talked about. How do you tell the story of a place that isn't there anymore? That's how. <laughs> Keep the paperwork, everybody. That's the answer. Yeah. yeah. Don't throw paintings on a bonfire. <laughs> If there's a lesson really? from today's video, it's dead. Yeah, lesson from today's video. Nilcum busty by pictorium. Dear me. <laughs> Dear me. So oh. that, was little, that was a little run through Abba Pergum. I'm quite sure the person who requested it, whose surname happened to be Williams, oh. and who has connections with Abba Pergum and Unus Glass House, mm. of course knows more about Abba Pergum. Than we do. Yeah. You can just sense it, can't you, Goff? The clues are there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've been a terrible disappointment to Chris Williams on this one. That's all I can say. <laughs> it's not the first time we've been a terrible disappointment on this podcast, but we carry on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So we shall see what happens next, I suppose. Yeah. See what we'll go. I guess we need to go back to Monmouthshire next, Goff. We've done two Glamorgans in a row. I know. We may be getting residency if we stay here any longer. <laughs> We might be forced out of Monmouthshire and Gwent do, yeah. uh, <laughs> yeah, any longer. Yeah, yeah. yeah, if Glamorgan ever secedes from Wales, we, we won't be able to leave. <laughs> well, on that note, um, thank you everyone uh, for uh, listening and watching and for subscribing as well, because we've had a little bump, haven't we, in subscribers? We have. Which we, is nice. We, we, it's, it's nice to have you join us and, uh, and, and follow what we're doing. And it, it's also very nice, again, this episode would not have come about had not somebody suggested this to us. So any suggestions are very, very welcome. And we will have a look at them at least, won't we? If we get, and if there's something in it, we'll, we'll tell you. Yeah, I did notice, by the way, Gov, you're quite right, of course, and, and anything you know about Abba Pergum, please let us know. Ian, oh, yeah. We can chat about it in the comments. I did notice our subscribers got a little bump, Gov, when we had a, de a delay in putting out a video. So basically, when we say nothing, our subscribers go up. There's probably something there for us to learn <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but thank you all for watching, and we shall see you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye.